I'm Barbara Wilcox. I am a writer here in the county, and this is my fourth courthouse docket. And I'm going to talk today about the College of San Mateo, which celebrates Centennial in 2022. Like all community colleges, uh, CSM is open access, it's open to the community, and it aims to be reflective of that community. What that means and how it works in practice has changed very much over CSM's first 100 years. Uh, a few months ago, CSM hired me to write 100 stories about the centennial history. I knew I could do it despite COVID and the closures and so on because I know how much San Mateo County values its history. CSM isn't the first community college in California. I believe it was the eighth. But it occupies an outsized role in the history of the county. Um, it is the largest college in San Mateo County, and it's the only public college, and it's one of the oldest colleges. Opening in 1922 with 35 students, it now has 10,000. And it's part of a three college district that serves more than 30,000 students a year. In between, College of San Mateo has occupied five campuses, and it has spun off many, many beloved community institutions. And these include uh, KCSM, the CSM Jazz Band, Jazz on the Hill, Family Science Day at the Catholic Planetary planetarium itself, Masterworks Chorale, the Asian Pacific American Film Festival, which uh, will celebrate its 11th year um, the following next May, um, Hillbarn Theater, and not least, as Carmen says, this very institution, the San Mateo County Historical Museum, which was housed for decades on college premises and was founded um, as a valuable teaching tool. <laughs> And because of its strategic location in the Bay Area, and because of its visionary leaders, CSM has had an inordinate influence in two fields, in sports and in educational equity reform. I'll talk about the College Readiness Program, which uh, made headlines in the 1960s and continues to inspire ways to engage underserved learners. I'll mention some top alumni including U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm, World War II Tuskegee Airman uh, Les Williams, and his cousin, pilot and Olympian champion sprinter Archie Williams. Many of the people who built CSM's legacy were offered higher profile jobs elsewhere. They could have gotten anywhere they wanted uh, because of their talents. But they stayed here or else they came back. They worked uh, here in the county because they thought this open access community college deserved the best they had to give. Uh, people like Jacob um, Beams, a PhD with the Manhattan Project, who returned to run the campus radio station uh, that was founded in 1926. We know it as KCSM. Tom Martinez, who had a chance to be head coach of the Raiders, but stayed here with the Bulldogs. Claire Mack, who became, uh, you know, after being a broadcaster, became San Diego's mayor. Um, Fred Berry, the trumpeter and the jazz band leader. Modesta Garcia, an Ivy League graduate who got her start in the college readiness program and left at Princeton, where she was working, to become a counselor at CSM. There are many, many more of these educators than I could mention here today. And in fact, telling their story in an hour would be like telling the history of San Mateo County in an hour. You just can't do it. So don't hate me for what I leave out, and I'll leave a long Q and A at the end for um, things that we might want to talk about and bring up. Well, the story of CSM begins very simply. In 1921, to expand access to higher education, California enacted a law that encouraged the opening of junior colleges by promising three-fourths of their instructional expenses would be paid by the state. San Mateo, both the city and the county, were very small then, and they couldn't afford to college without the uh, state help. So, in 1922, voters in San Mateo and Burlingame established San Mateo Junior College, 
uh, to give local students the first two years of a four-year education for free, close to home. The rest of the county um, joined the college district by bits and starts later, um, ending up in by 1976, the bulk of it had joined. But that was the start, so we were in Burlingame. The college opened that August in the upstairs of San Mateo High School, which was then on Baldwin Avenue. Classes started around 5 p.m. after the high schoolers left. This quickly became unwieldy, and the college moved after a year to Charles Polmas's old mansion, which is now demolished in uh, San Mateo Central Park. Here's an early class on the steps. And by class, I mean you know everybody in the college. Um, You'll hear this house described as the coal mansion. There's another coal mansion in Burlingame that's still around. This one is not. Um, soon it had uh, 480 students who were still in over in tents that were pitched outside. You see, until the 1930s, San Mateo was the only community college in most of the Bay Area. Only San Jose City College is in Burlingame. So many students came from San Francisco, hundreds from San Francisco, the East Bay, um, all over, and those localities would pay the quarter, uh, the 25% of their ADA that the state was not paying. Um, in 1927, San Mateo College moved back to Baldwin Avenue uh, when the high school got its own new campus. There's the gym at the Baldwin campus. Um, due first to the Depression and later to deadlock and creative differences among college leaders, the CSM ended up using Baldwin for nearly 30 more years. It purchased land during the Depression on Delaware Avenue, uh, near Caddy Quarter to the present San Mateo High School, and it began building there. After World War II, to cope with the post-war surge in enrollment, CSM also acquired use of the former Merchant Marine Trading School at Coyote Point. Did anyone here attend Coyote Point or teach there? Oh, I've heard stories. I've heard stories. <laughs> She's laughing. It was quite a place. It was like a day camp. It was like a uh, camp for adults. Yes, it was. Yeah. 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 Um, for years, CSM held classes at these three sites simultaneously, Baldwin, Delaware, and Coyote Point. It shuttled uh, students on buses between them. And as I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, you could take sequential classes at Delaware and Coyote Point or Baldwin and Delaware, but you could not take classes at Baldwin and Coyote Point because you couldn't get there in time. Right, okay, I got that right. Not until 1963 did CSM have a single purpose built campus. Uh, until then, it ran those buses and borrowed theaters and sports fields and all kinds of other facilities for everywhere from everywhere else in the, in the county. Um, a writer from the campus, San Mateo, uh, said in 1938 there was an upside to all of this. He wrote, the entire county is our campus. We are everywhere. Well, location helped San Mateo Junior College become a sports powerhouse. It happened to be close to two major sports schools, Stanford and Cal. And so coaches there, and also as SoCal, um, would steer their prospects there for finishing. Um, in the days before athletes sent film in every place, Bay Area coaches and recruiters could very easily see how the athletes in San Mateo were doing. Um, San Mateo very early developed a tradition of great athletes and even more of great coaches. And it helped that, it kept that juggernaut rolling. Bill Walsh and Dick Vermeule uh, coached CSM football. John Madden played here in 1954, before uh, eventually going on to become a Super Bowl coach himself. Walsh played here in 51 and 52. This little shot is um, Walsh's uh, 1951 player head shot. The first, though, of our great athletes was Archie Williams, who was on the photo to the right. He was one of the many students who came here in search of an education from Alameda County. He had family ties here. His uncle was Noah Williams, 
uh, owner and chef of the great Noah's Ark restaurant in downtown San Mateo. Um, this museum has Noah's murals and his tableware and did a great exhibit a, a while back. Um, after seasoning as a bulldog runner, Archie competed for UC Berkeley and uh, won the NCAA championship in the 400 yards, and then went to the 1936 Olympics, where he won gold in the 400 meters. And the city of San Francisco gave him this terrific victory parade down Market Street, and they gave him the keys to the city. Archie went on to become a pilot, a meteorologist, and a civilian trainer for the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, including who, who included his cousin Les Williams, uh, CSM class of 39, Noah Stone. Here is uh, Les Williams with his B-25 bomber crew in uh, World War II. Latter-day greats include Julian, Julian Edelman, who was born in Redwood City, played for the Bulldogs in uh, 05 and 06, and um, went to Trent, Kent State, was eventually drafted by the New England Patriots, where as a wide receiver, he won three Super Bowl rings and was the 2019 Super Bowl MVP. Um, you can see him and many other uh, more CSM athletes in this building in the Pinocchio Sports Hall of Fame. And I'm speaking of the Patriots, CSM has a Tom Brady connection. Brady's from San Mateo, as you know, and CSM football coach Tom Martinez was Brady's personal throwing coach for his entire career since he was 15 years old. Um, Martinez says in his oral history for the college that Brady, and Brady called him after every Patriots game. Martinez is not as well known as Walsh or Madden. He's one of those people I mentioned earlier who could have gone anywhere um, who stayed at uh, CSM. He deserves a closer look because he's part of two other blue lines that are important to education history, namely gender equity and the impact to state funding from Proposition 13. Tom was the one who launched women's softball and basketball at CSM in the days after Title IX. Uh, that 1973 law mandated gender, uh, gender equity in institutions that received federal funding. Um, its greatest impact has probably been in the educational field. Um, here is Tom with the early 1980s women's softball team. Um, softball is today probably the most successful of CSM sports. Uh, the team has won 10 division uh, 10 uh, conference championships. Um, I believe in 10 of the last 11 years, and in its 2021 season was undefeated in 27 games. Um, a few years after Prop 13 was enacted, in fact, women's sports were allowed, how Martinez was able to keep his job. Prop 13, of course, by prop capping property taxes, almost immediately forced cuts in arts, drama, sports, summer school, all through the Education. Um, the cuts were felt immediately, and then they got they got worse over time until strategies were developed to help regain some stability. Well, when administrators looked at staffing in the early '80s, what with football and everything else, uh, Martinez was doing, he was considered to have a full-time job. Um, all the part-time coaches were let go, and in the early 1980s, CSM men's basketball was coached by a part-timer. And that is the story of how CSM lost its main basketball team, among many other assets. Some of these assets, fortunately, like Hillborn Theater and like Master and Corpus Corral, were uplifted and supported by the community, which took over their support. But not until 2018 did men's basketball come back to CSM. Having and financing all these programs, sports, music, and drama, doesn't, it's not necessarily about, and as teachers we know this, creating professional athletes or musicians or actors, um, although CSM has produced plenty of those and we'll see some later. You're creating an environment where students can grow their identities, and that is not always a direct route, and those activities help. This drama major at CSM in 1978 won a scholarship to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. 
In high school, she was Miss San Carlos, and then Miss San Mateo County, and she, she thought she would be a model. But at CSM, she developed an interest in acting and public speaking. She went to law school. Jennifer Granholm moved to Michigan and became his attorney general, and then its governor. And early in 2021, President Biden named her the U.S. Secretary of Energy. People like her found a path at CSM thanks to some visionary leaders who made CSM a place to grow and to blow. Charles Morris came here in 1931 from Modesto, and he served till 1952. He kept CSM going through amazing uh, leadership challenges, the Depression, World War II, which brought chaotic swings in enrollment and funding. He kept the college unified in spirit, despite all the shuffling between multiple campuses. He was an athlete. He was the number two decathlete in the nation in 1913. Um, the event was then called the All Around, and unlike in today's decathlon, he competed all 10 events in the same day. Morris was 6'4", and people call him Jump for Jumbo. He had the energy to keep close tabs on the students and to prevent them from being rowdy. He went to steady anger. For 21 years, he attended every school game, every conference, every assembly, often with his wife here, Carlina, a.k.a. Ma, who was a campus leader in her own right. Uh, Ma Morris's dad had run a resort hotel in Florida, and she, she picked up a lot of his hospitality skills and his logistics skills. She opened and ran dormitories for, home, for male students during the Depression who would have otherwise been homeless, and again after World War II opened dorms. She founded the Mother's Club, which raised money and supplies and it offered room and board to female students so they could continue their education during, during these hard times. And it was Ma, and again, and she kept close tabs on all of these kids, was Ma Morris who got one young student in trouble. Uh -huh. Merv Griffin, who was a freshman in 1943, was already an impresario, and this was his first campus assembly, and it turns out his last. Ma did not like his choice of entertainment, Joan Eloise and her Spanish hula. Uh, Merv claimed he was asked to leave, but he was always very gracious to CN, CSM, and he um, was a uh, stalwart supporter of uh, KCSM radio and TV. Well, Charles Morris greatly expanded the mission of the college. He brought it out into the community, both literally and figuratively. He started the college's programs in adult and career education in 1950, in 1932. Before then, CSM offered basically the first two years of the four-year liberal arts program, and that um, had a limited um, audience. You know, there was a limited public for that. But starting in 1932, you could train for work in anything from aeronautics to floriculture. And Morris, uh, Morris pounded the community for assets to use in this training, like Ampex tape recorders and killer helicopters and um, all that kind of stuff. Within a very few years, I think as little as three years, adult students outnumbered those in the traditional program. Morris also acquired the Delaware Avenue campus, which was a feat during the Depression. And when that proved insufficient, the Merchant Marine School had cut at a point. He died after a heart attack he suffered on duty, supervising a dance in 1952 at the Coyote Point Gym. Two years later, in April 1954, San Mateo Junior College changed its name. It wanted to reflect this broader and this different role in the community, and it wasn't really junior to anything. But for many people, their only higher education, the only college they would go to. I can't find it formalized anywhere, but people at the time testified that the initials of the new name, CSM, as well as of the radio station, which was uh, named a little bit earlier, um, honor Morris by using his initials, um, CSM. Well, KCSM, the radio and TV stations, could fill their own time. I will only Content uh, us with some high points. 
San Mateo Junior College's radio went on the air in 1926, making it eight years older than the Federal Communications Commission itself. It was with the oldest uh, radio station in California, or even the oldest studio, uh, uh, studio radio station, but it was one of the longest lived, and radio has been taught almost continuously um, at CSM since then. Um, I'm broadcasting, I should say, over the television. Um, here is the original station on the roof of the Baldwin Avenue campus to your left, uh, with its original call letters 6YU, or W6YU. Because of how AM radio winds behave, broadcast and reception were best in the very early morning. So radio club members went up on the roof before dawn, and their goal was to reach other stations as far away as possible. At no charge, they would send radio messages, initially by telegraph and this code, from students or locals, local people, to people in other countries. In 1931, they sent 300 messages overseas. Um, by 1940, W6YU was broadcast at 1400 at the AM dial. And its um, transmitter then was not super strong. Um, you could get it basically in San Mateo, and that was about it. Um, much of the equipment, all the way up to the 1960s and the first TV antenna, was designed and built by Professor of Engineering Jacob um, Beats. While he taught here, Beats got his PhD at Berkeley, and then he paused teaching to work on the Manhattan Project uh, during World War II, which developed the atomic bomb. College radio itself had to pause on the West Coast during World War II because of uh, wartime curves on broadcasting. It was felt that radio signals could be used to, to guide in enemy aircraft. Um, the Fed said after the war that colleges could only over operate FM stations at certain points in the dial, and that um, everybody involved had to have FCC licensure. And it took several years for CSM to raise funds for this enhanced program. Um, and during this time, broadcasting students presented their work on local radio stations like KVSM, The Voice of San Mateo. Does that ring a bell, you maybe? <laughs> the Voice of San Mateo. And one of the on-air uh, guys was Art Lowe, who later became an oldies DJ, and he coined the phrase, oldies with goodies. Another one. According to the San Mateo and KCSM, FM went on the air February 11, 1953. Um, here are some of those early students on the right uh, broadcasting. Uh, somebody's cueing, I guess, the guy at the mic to read his, his bit. Um, the TV license came 10 years later. It was only the second community college TV station in the United States. And part of its mission was to expand access to learning through broadcasting for people who, for whatever reason, could not make it to a campus or were disinclined to sit in a college campus with young kids. Um, at its high point in the 1960s, more than 2,000 students were taking courses uh, via CSM uh, Channel 14 College of the Air. And they only had to come to campus twice, once at the beginning of the semester and then once at the end to take the exam. Well, the TV station was very expensive to operate. And there was always tension, and especially after Prop 13, between student hands-on production, which costs a lot, and um, versus uh, programming that one way or another would generate revenue, either because you sell the airtime to somebody who wants to put on a show, or because you um, produce something that enough people want that other public stations will buy it. Um, after a lot of developments, including a change in channel, KCSM was finally sold to TV in 2018. KCSM at that of course, became a jazz station. It was general manager, Dante Vitello, in the music library, in the basement of CSM's library. And this is the fifth largest jazz collection in the United States. One of the DJs, um, Jesse Chuivarela, is digitizing the music library to preserve it as a resource that he is looking for volunteers once things open up a little bit. But the idea is to digitize it so that it will be 
um, an asset for uh, future generations and um, that, can't, that can't use the, the vital medium for, to, to um, separate, to, to protect the vital medium against loss or damage. But let's zoom out and look at how the library and how the CSN campus got there. After Charles Morris's death, there followed some dark days at CSN. Not so much for the students who loved Coyote Point. Uh, the Merchant Marine left fantastic recreation facilities, uh, beautiful views. Um, the conflicts were behind the scenes. Morris's successor, Elon Hildreth, wanted to remain at Coyote Point and build a permanent campus there. He wanted the Commandant's house, the only building from those days that is still standing, as a CSM presidential re uh, residence for himself. This annoyed a lot of people, and he annoyed a lot of people. So trustees wanted to expand in Delaware. And meanwhile, students were still shuffling back and forth among the other three campuses until Mills Hospital System took over Baldwin in 55, and then CSM was back in 92. Well, all of this shuffling finally showed up in CSM's accreditation. The accreditation board said that until CSM committed to consolidating its campus, it could only have one year of accreditation instead of the usual two. Enter Eleanor Nettle. She had been women's president of the class of 31. She was inspired to run for the community college board on a anti hildreth pro-new campus platform. She served on that board for uh, roughly 30 years. At a time when there were very few female elected officials in uh, California, Middle was the impetus behind the district's 25-year master plan. And uh, it saw input from a wider range of community leaders, uh, union officials, uh, tech executives, people who knew about industry and job trends and what would be required. Um, and it called for a three-campus uh, college district, North, San Mateo, and South. And Eleanor Nettle led the search committee that found uh, CXM's next visionary president, Julio Bortolazzo. Bortolazzo was a classic Cold War liberal, um, like Clark Kerr at the University of California. And he loved to have phrase and his famous line, the purpose of the College of San Mateo is not to make ideas safe for students. The purpose of the college is to make students safe for ideas. Well, Bortolazzo and Nettle led the highly orchestrated campaign to pass the 1957 body measure that funded the College Heights campus. The campus was designed by John Carl Hornicke, who worked for John F. Kennedy. And it embodies in concrete that mid-century, strong-armed Cold War liberalism that Bortolazzo, and for that matter, Kennedy, embodied in the flesh. He commands the hill as a beacon of progress, a temple of learning, even though this entails filling parts of the hilly site with up to 80 feet of length of hill. And it led to a year's delay and massive cost overruns. But it had, in addition to the TV station, a theater, a planetarium, which has since been um, replaced, and by square footage, one of America's largest community college libraries. By design, the, site, the library and the science buildings had the best views because, and they were most visible from town, because they were thought to be beacons of learning and the leading edge of learning. Where lots of compliments of this look with a VAP lineup of guest speakers. He brought in the head of the American Communist Party to great outrage from many county residents who were still then quite conservative. Not only did Bortolazzo back down, but he doubled down with a debate between himself and young communist leader his man. Despite, or as he would say, in tune with this great freedom of expression. Bortolazzo insisted that everyone stop what they were doing when the U.S. flag was raised each morning on campus at 8 a.m. and stand in respectful silence. And finally, in 1966, 
were lots of green light of the initiative that would bring CSM probably its greatest national attention. This was the college readiness program, initially for African American students. Rolasa was inspired by the 1965 Civil Rights Action of Selma, Alabama, to explain black access to higher education. Back then, CSM had only a handful of African American students, and of, of these, a small amount, only 1% went on to a four year college. For the last five years, he got exactly one. Uh, Jean Worth, a young English instructor who was already an activist for disability rights, she helped um, Ed Roberts, the first quadriplegic to uh, graduate CSM in Berkeley. She helped him. Uh, get on to Berkeley, and actually Philip Morse, the um, dean of students, personally drove uh, Ed to campus and make sure that he was housed there. So Jean Worth was on, on board for the task. Uh, Robert Hoover, an East Palo Alto community <coughs> leader, became CRP's director. This is Bob um, in 1968. Uh, this new program enrolled only students of whom formal education has shown no expectations at all. Worth said, unquote, they had to be of color, they had to be poor, they had to have done badly in school, they had to hate school, and they had to not want to go on to more school. That was a very, very intentional selection, so that if we were using it as a pilot to demonstrate anything, it would. About 40 students, all African American and mostly from East Palo Alto signed up in summer 1966. They took six weeks of English and math and, if they wanted, worked a few hours daily and worked steady jobs around campus. Um, a free bus or carpool took them to school and back, and tutors came to their homes each evening. So they got a lot of personal outreach. Um, if they failed to show for class, work or whoever would get in their cars and come to East Palo Alto looking for them. Uh, the program addressed all aspects of the student's life, you know, anything that might possibly be used uh, as an excuse to prevent them from college success. It anticipated their needs, which might be legion, without treating those needs as deficiencies. And that, I think, was the key, and that is what inspires um, people today. Of the initial 40 students, all but three continued at CSM. Where the program grew, Black students enrolled from throughout the Bay Area and beyond. Soon, the Tinks and Asian American students asked to come aboard, and they were accepted as well. By 1968, CSM, which had been predominantly white for so long, enrolled more than 1,000 students of color, 650 of whom were black. This gentleman is Oscar Rios, who later became mayor of Watsonville. He was a CRP student in 1968. Uh, here's Lenny Hale Haysburg, the guy on the middle. His kid brother is the actor Dennis Haysburg, who is also a CSM alum. You probably know him as President Palmer on the series 24, or else the voice of all state insurance. On the far right is Carlos Joe Costa, also an actor who uh, is, does a lot of Hallmark Christmas movies. These photos were taken in 1968 by Asaka Tanaka. A CSM photographer who was not just talented, but who was conscious in his role of um, chronicling history. Like many photogra photog photographers of 1960s activism, he hid his files so they couldn't be seized in subpoena. This happened at Stanford, and the case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, where it was never dated in Boston. It was a real worry. Um, he hid them so well that in the 1990s, these and other documents were recovered from discard piles during campus remodeling. And Gus Petropoulos and Bill Runberg saved those photos and other documents and obtained funds to have the photos digitized. Well, you can see them online at uh, collegestreetsanmateo.edu backslash archive, photo archive. And all the photos are still there for the public to, to discover. It's an example of how people here love history. Well, soon CRP had enrolled more students than could be accommodated in promised counseling or jobs. The students got very upset about this. And furthermore, they, they felt empowered to ask inconvenient questions. 
which they might have not if they had been treated as, you know, remedial students or people who were kind of not really deserving to be there. Um, they asked, why do textbooks cost so much? Why were CSM bookstore profits being diverted to Skyline and Kamiata to form bookstores there? The colleges were just opening. Why weren't more faculty of color? So they ran for campus office and they ran for homecoming queen. And the latter was a radical act because it stated that blackness was beautiful in a time and place where that was not a universal truth. And white people on campus, both students and staff, were not all completely on board. Some were very uneasy about this. Some uh, CRP student participants had ties to militant movements um, or had friends who did, and their rhetoric uh, scared the, uh, the older generation, and it drew the interest of the FBI. When Bordelotto left CSM in early 1968 for unrelated reasons, um, his successor, Robert Ulrich Ewerglaven, began backing away from CRP. In fact, it, I'm, I'm told that Ewing Glavin and Bob Hoover never spoke uh, in person. And that's how much distance uh, management wanted to keep from this, from this program. Though Ewing Glavin had access to funds that would have eased the program's crowding and would have provided the services that these students uh, had contracted for, had signed up for, he chose not to accept them. Well, in fall 1968, which was a violent season nationwide, tensions also erupted in the College of San Mateo. On October, October 15, CRP supporters staged the sit-in, and they chained the doors of the administration building. Um, here are some of them. Um, you can see them kind of they're sitting on counters and just kind of saying, you know, what's do we do now? Um, there were other rallies. Counter protesters wore blue armbands and faced them off at these rallies, and they called for law and order, but I'm told that they also shouted racial slurs. So it was very tense. Um, he would have been brought in more and more police, heightened the tension, and crisis arrived December 13th when, during what was supposed to be a peaceful march, hundreds of demonstrators swept through campus, broke windows, and injured several students and faculty. Margarita Aguirre, a CSM student who worked for CMP, CRP, was an eyewitness, and I spoke to her about this. And she said, we were supposed to be at peace. Uh, Martin Luther King had been assassinated uh, that summer, and we wanted to be at peace. And I thought, what, what is this? I was scared. I wanted to go home, but I didn't dare. I wanted to stay and be a witness. And she saw guys, you know, who she says were not CSM students breaking bottles over people's heads. Well, classes were closed for a week and resumed under guard of 400 uh, San Francisco Tactical Squad officers who checked IDs at campus gates. On January 6th, uh, three firebombs went off in town. One was lobbed into the garage of CSM Dean of Instruction at Garlington, who had been sort of an enemy of the program damaging his home, but fortunately causing no injuries. The FBI investigated and it cleared all CSM affiliates in the uprising. It said no CSM students were involved in um, the bombing. Um, Hoover was given a non-teaching role advising the district on diversity, but was forbidden to teach. Worth was moved out of the program, but kept on the payroll, provided she would agree that I was never allowed to speak with a black student. The well, College of San Mateo's college readiness program had three important and far-reaching consequences that affect us today. First, it prompted California legislators for the first time to fund outreach for college students of color. Um, Ewan Glavin was came in for a lot of criticism, both from the right and the left wings size of the political spectrum. Um, many uh, conservatives um, said that, you know, he dropped the ball. He signed up students, or his school signed up students uh, for services that he did not provide, um, uh, aggravated discontent, um, uh, overreaction.
reflected uh, in the police response. And he, um, that was pretty much the end, actually, of his um, career in community colleges. But, and, and other uh, people like State Senator Al Alquist said, you know, this shouldn't happen again. So Alquist uh, carried legislation in 1968 called Extended Opportunity Programs and Services. And his uh, bill, which passed, uh, it passed the Reagan um, uh, influenced State Senate, which was Republican. Um, created these kinds of programs at every community college in, in California and uh, created funding for them. Initially, I think it was $3 million. Um, until the 1980s, services funded by the state initiative, the OPS, carried on at CSM under the CRP name until, uh, until uh, I think, 1989, 79 or 89. And the folks who run EOPS today at College of San Mateo consider CRP their direct ancestor, their foundational uh, philosophy. Although many factors besides race now determine eligibility for EOPS services, such as um, being a parent, student parent, being not having a high school degree, and other kinds. It is the spectrum of ways you can be eligible. In the second I uh, am, CFP empowered its students to do cool things and empowered them to better the condition of their communities and to improve teaching and learning because they had been treated as empowered from the start. Oscar Rios, who I mentioned, started out as a farm worker activist and then went into politics. Warren Furutani, who might have been growing up in LA, who was thrown out of CSM for his revolutionary activity got elected to the LA Unified School Board, and then to the State Assembly in 2008. Bob Hoover founded Nairobi College in East Palo Alto, a private school that was funded by erstwhile COP donors, whose money CSM had turned down for that very purpose. Well, partly because it was near Stanford, Nairobi inspired a lot of thinking about how learners of color get treated disadvantageously as well as uh, inspiring curriculum and teaching techniques to address that. And all of these alums and all of their work had a ripple effect. Gordon Duvall, who had been a CRP tutor, became a dean of the Yale School of the Environment. He told me that while he didn't think about much about it at the time, in the 1960s, tutoring CRP helped him choose education as the most important career that he could possibly have. And finally, and maybe most important, CRP was an early example of the value of cohort learning. Uh, the black and brown students in CRP worked together for a good part of the school day, and they learned to be responsible to each other for their learning, for their achievement, um, for their conduct. They established a learning community. And in the past 20 years, research has affirmed the value this kind of community learning and see colleges, including CSM, have embraced learning community in a very big way. CSM has MANA for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, Umoja for Black learners, Wente for the Think students, Riding in the End Zone for male athletes, and there's a new program just launched for, for women athletes at CSM, just to name a few. Well, many of these communities were fostered by CSM's new president, Dr. Taylor, Jennifer Taylor Mendoza, in her past roles as director of CSM's Learning Center and dean of academic support and learning technologies. Uh, and in fact, Dr. Taylor Mendoza wrote her dissertation on black learning communities in California community colleges, which I imagine would have to include CRP. I hope it did. Because that's a nice way to wrap up that brings us full circle. CSM has made history in all kinds of ways, and it's a history that future generations will benefit and draw from, and I hope uh, preserve and carry forward. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> questions? When is your book coming out, and what is it called? Well, it's not going to be a print book, it's a digital series. And it's at this um, website, collegeofsanmateo.edu slash 100. And there are 
I think, 20, 25 stories up so far. There will be 100, including a lot of the material that I've presented today. It was felt that, although I was hiring a good time, a book takes a lot of time to produce. It's very expensive to produce and to, and to market. And it was felt that uh, an online resource would get to people more easily. Uh, you say no? You want a book? I do. My Mac is 11 years old. Okay. And I just had it updated. It can only go to 2011. I can't update it anymore. How's your phone? My phone's fine. It's in my kitchen. Oh, okay. Uh, well, okay. I'm telling you, I don't know how to use an ATM. I'm not interested in learning, and I will never have a cell phone. I don't want brain cancer or whatever else. Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm 20th century very much okay. and I'm comfortable with it. But I, I, as a professor, a book is my best friend, a real book. I would, you know, I would, I would pass that, um, I would pass that information along to the powers that be. It cost. I know that in my book, if I had to publish it myself, it would have cost thirty thousand dollars. Um, is that's not really the end of black and white photos. You know? yes. um, the, the problem is it also takes a long time. Um, uh, there will be probably nine months of production, depending on what publisher uh, CSA used. And I know Stanford put out a book when I worked on Stanford's anniversary, and they have, well, they didn't need to order 3,000 copies, but that's what they did, and there's probably 2,500 still in the basement, uh, some basement on the floor. And so that's that's what you're up against when you want a book. It's it's a but yeah, I, I mean I loved writing a book. It, it it kind of separates you from, from the other writers. And maybe um, maybe there can be some kind of exhibit. Well, how would that be? Like interpretive display. Would that float the boat? Well, the other thing I would I would just print it out and go find someone to bind it with it. Well there you go. So, there you go. Yeah, it's any other questions? Is there going to be some sort of a centennial event? Yeah. I'm told that there, I, I, I am on the committee that is planning those events. Or, um, it's a very large committee, which Costell is on it. All, all kinds of people are on it, civic and business leaders. Um, um, there is a event planned at the Cole Mansion in Burlingame for April. And we are now uh, deciding what other kinds of, and that has to be you know, locked in, a, a long range of events. We're deciding what to do, and it, a lot of it depends on when students can come to school, when we can open up social again. And so a lot of the planning can't happen because that epidemiological uh, Climate is rolling in around faster than, than humans can plan. So, I mean, that's, I worked on Stanford 125, that's how I got this job. So, we had a lot of events. We had walks, we had, um, we had a trail hike, we had uh, speakers, we had um, student events, we had cultural events, and all of those things were super popular. And, and partly because they were, they were not directly coupled with requests for money. You know, so you could go there and enjoy yourself, and you wouldn't necessarily get a touch. Although that was always kind of, you know, and you, you couldn't be too naked without a student. That was always on people's minds. Um, I'm hoping so. I'm advocating for that because I, I, it's what people want. And the faster we can get out in the world and tell people that the centennial is happening, um, the more people will come around with ideas of how to celebrate. So that it was not imposed on them from above. Um, yeah, no, it's it's the logo was made by a student, Ryan Kelly. Uh, he is a freshman from Hillsdale High, and yeah, no, it, there was a contest, and there were four finalists, and um, the committee voted, and his was the one that won. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of talent at CSM, and, and, but you know, it's very few classes this semester are even in person, so it's hard to think about having parties.